All right, again, my name is Wes King. Uh, I'm primarily a JavaScript developer, so I feel like the JavaScript heretic at the Cake PHP conference right now. So, um, But I'm not here to talk too much about JavaScript, although I am covering Backbone.js today. Uh, I think it's really cool that Ms. Felina did the Angular.js presentation because uh, I'm a big fan of JavaScript frameworks myself. And really, I think that as a new paradigm, as a whole, JavaScript frameworks do a really great job of doing a lot of things that we didn't have previously when it came to typical web development. Uh, the biggest things are separation of concerns, primarily, because Whenever you have your UI layer separated from your business logic layer, you have less to worry about when it comes to actually having to deal with your errors on your front end versus your back end. Um, second, when it comes to JavaScript libraries, it allows you to process the, uh, the processing power of the client. So from there, you're actually having less of a load on your, your server, and you're offsetting a lot of that to your end user. Uh, and finally, JavaScript as a language has evolved a lot over the past few years. It does a lot of really cool stuff now. So. Moving on, um, again, it's really cool that Ms. Felina did this. I'm a personal believer that really when it comes to choosing your libraries, uh, you should always choose what best fits your use case. Um, a lot of libraries, you really can't say one is better than the other. So really, the biggest thing is both are excellent frameworks for trying to create a UI layer. Um, really, it's my personal belief that uh, from a, a UI standpoint, Backbone's view layer is done more as a first class first class citizen from the scripting, whereas Angular via its directives is manipulated more from the DOM. Um, really, it's best whatever is necessary for your use case, your mileage may vary. So moving on, the biggest thing uh, that I love about CakePHP is the resources method within the router. You can very quickly mock out a REST API to be able to be consumed by your front end. Um, and really, these are the only two lines. And you could probably only need one of these lines in, in reality. And this, all this says is this maps out an entire API RESTful endpoint based on my Ninja's controller. So moving on, once we have this set up, our entire endpoint maps out to these functions within the Ninja's controller. Um, Complete RESTful architecture, ready to go, ready to be consumed by a number of different JavaScript libraries, including Backbone. So now we're actually going to get a little bit more into Backbone. I'm going to slow down just a little bit now that we're into the meat of the presentation. Um, Backbone as a whole is not necessarily a framework so much as it is a library. It's a consistent, it consists of objects that makes it more helpful for you in being able to associate your front end UI with your back end objects and your, your API, of course. So I'm a personal fan of namespacing my APIs via version numbers. That allows you to have redundancy when it comes to previous APIs and not having to deprecate something too quickly and messing your users over in the long run. Um, but as you see here, the very first thing that we've done is I've defined a ninja's collection object that's extend from the base collection object in Backpack. From there, I've actually built the actual ninjas object that consists of the collection in Backbone. And from there, after that, I call the fetch method on my ninjas object. And literally, if I were to instantiate this object with this URL key inside of it, everything is taken care of for me. Once I have my API mocked out via cake and I have data in my database and I'm ready to go, once I call fetch, that entire Backbone collection already knows what to do to instantiate those objects from the API, stores it inside of the collection, and you're ready to manipulate that to allow your views to be able to set up in whatever way that you need them to be. Um, I'm not going to go too far into the actual view layer of Backbone today because I'm more worried about talking about the consumption of the API within Backbone itself, but it's literally as simple as that. Um, now, as I move on, there's a couple things that I really like about Backbone. Uh, number one is the amount of minimalism you get from it. As a whole, the minified version of Backbone is less than 10 kilobytes. It's tiny. Uh, you can literally go over the entire source in the matter of an afternoon and know the entire thing. Um, another thing is the UI within Backbone is agnostic. Uh, that's why it's referred to as Backbone, is because it gives you a really rich application layer to be able to manipulate whatever kind of UI that you want, in the sense that uh, in Angular, uh, typically, you're, you're manipulating DOM objects a lot more than anything, but in, in Backbone, you can associate your view layer with uh, maybe a canvas if you wanted to to create really rich HTML5 games, um, GIS software that relies on JavaScript to run. There's just a number of different possibilities. Next, if you're familiar with KPHP's collections object, um, the documentation actually states that it and underscore are very similar to each other. A lot of the same methods, everything. It's extensible when it comes to synchronization, so you can consume any kind of uh, method of API that you would like. And when it comes to templating, you can use pretty much anything that you want. Uh, from there, uh, there's a couple of options you have to extend beyond that. Uh, Marionette, a very cool library, allows you to create different kinds of views, particularly uh, composite views, which is an abstraction of a tree view, collection view, that's pretty self-explanatory. And lastly, but certainly not least, a couple examples that you can find really good uses of backbone.js. That's it. Thank you.
Ooh, that was fast. <laughs> Alright, OAuth 2.7 for PHP 3. Um, quick bit about me, I'm not going to read that, you can read it in your own time. Um, OAuth, it's an authorization, authorization framework. Um, it allows for third party integrations, APIs, clients to authenticate as a user without needing to know what your user's password is. Um, there's a number of different workflows or grants that are supported. There's the authorization code grant for your basic server-side applications. Uh, it's a pretty flow diagram. Implicit grant for client-side or mobile applications, so Backbone, Angular, iOS, Android, etc. Um, password grant for applications that are trusted with your user's password. Normally, it would be a first-party first integration or first-party app. Um, client credentials grant is for the actual client to authenticate as itself for its own internal data, updating refresh tokens. And, and the last one is a refresh grant, which is for expi refreshing expired tokens. Um, there exists a group called the League of Extraordinary Packages, or the PHP League. They have a collection of packages that solve common problems, and one of them is an OAuth 2 server. We built a CakePHP 3 plugin that uses the PHP League's OAuth server. Um, there's the URL for it. It currently supports the authorization code grant and the refresh grant. Installation is easy. Composer require, Composer load, migrate. Configuration, um, update your auth component to include the OAuth server dot OAuth authorization or authenticate class. Um, update your login method to redirect back to the OAuth authorized page if it's an OAuth Request um, usage. Quick, quick and easy and dirty way of getting a um, admin controller in place is to use the Friends of Cake Crud View plugin. And um, that's just a quick. It's, this is all in the README file. Just a quick example of the controller. Okay, first of all, you create a client. The I don't know if you can see that, but the OAuth. Our, our, our plugin already creates a client ID and a client secret for you. Um, quick test, this is um, Postman, very cool tool for testing REST APIs. Um, you add the client ID, client ID, the client secret. You click on get access token. It opens up the user login page. You log in, shows you a authenticate page. Click on approve, get back an access token and a refresh token. Then you can put an authorization header, set JSON, do a request. Next to do is some unit tests, some more unit tests, and then adding support for the rest of the grant types. Got a minute for questions. <laughs> when we need them. <laughs> um, it, it's on GitHub. Um, pull requests are welcome.
Alright, hey guys, my name is uh, Nicholas. I'm uh, just like Wes here. I'm going to be a heretic and uh, the KPHP conference and, and do JavaScript, except I'm shamelessly going to do just JavaScript here. Um, this is something I've been working on for the past two weeks in my free time, and uh, it's the concept is uh, cross-tab communication. I want to open up with a question. How many of y'all have uh, multiple monitors at your workstation? Almost everybody. Um, I'm sure many of you will drag out a tab and have it on multiple monitors. Uh, one, one concept I've never seen is, is a multi-monitor application, or a multi-monitor web app, rather. Uh, multiple monitor websites. Uh, this concept is a fully front-end uh, application that is it's a very simple jQuery plugin. And what it's doing is uh, talking back and forth across tabs on the same browser via uh, JavaScript's local storage. So local storage is like a persistent object. It's a key value pair system that just stores uh, the value of, of a certain key that you push into it. So uh, what we have here is three tabs that are, are three three different windows that are open on the same browser, and as long as they're within the same uh, same domain, accessing the same website, uh, an event will fire on all other open tabs except the one that you fire that event or that that you pushed into local storage. Uh, so like what we have here is uh, we could press this button and it'll actually pop up a row on the other two tabs. Uh, what we have here is a little table. It, it tells you what the event is, the kind, uh, what what happened in that event, and response time. And I, I got a checkoff system built too. So <clears throat> we can keep on pushing events into this, and you can see the the uh, response time there. It's it's pretty quick. How fast it'll it, it slows down the more more tabs you have open. Uh, but the, the checkoff system there is actually showing the ID, the, unique, the, the last six characters of the unique ID of each tab. And what that's doing is, wh when, I, when I get the system fully flushed out, what it'll do is, uh, once each tab is completely done with that, it can actually say, hey, I'm done with this object, and then that object will get deleted from the local storage. Um, as you can see, it's, it's pretty quick. We can actually hold down and, and count down in fractions of a second. Um, and we, I also have uh, stuff built in here so that whenever an object updates, all other tabs are known. Uh, so we can, I mean, this is just a quick little example. We can actually just type in there and you can see how it's actually getting pushed to all the tabs. Um, and another thing, just once, it, once those objects are deleted, they're deleted from the other tabs as well. Um, this is a project I have up on GitHub if anybody's interested. And extending that, like I said, I've just been working on it in my free time for the past two weeks. So, uh, NDVL, cross tab if anyone's interested. Yeah, thank you. already ticking. All right. Okay, so is this on? Okay, so let's talk about cyclomatic complexity. I don't know how to pronounce it though. So um, basically it means execution paths. So let's look at a shipping uh, function. So it gets, uh, you know, if the total is less than at least $50, then it will return zero. And the last line will not be executed. So this is the first execution path that's possible within this function. Now, if it, the amount is lower than 50, then the line with the zero will be skipped and the last one will be executed. So now this function with the if has two execution paths. Each time you add a condition in your code, you're creating a new execution path. So yeah, cyclomatic complexity is just a fancy term to mean how different paths can your code take during execution. So how is that useful? Well, for testing, for example, if you test with $100 subtotal, then you're not testing the last line. So maybe what happens if there's a bug and you accidentally give free shipping to all the people, even if they buy for like $1, that makes no sense. Uh, you won't know unless unless you test both execution paths or unless you realize that you're hemorrhaging money. Uh, each decision branch in your code introduces a new execution path. Here's an example. Um, you have a product loop, so you go over each product, and then you know after after you finished uh, calculating the subtotal, you check whether there's free shipping. Uh, you know due to the fact that it's under or over fifty dollars, 
and then maybe the user selected to have a gift wrap so you need all of those uh, if decision is a branch a loop is also a decision branch well how why is the loop actually a decision branch because your program needs to decide whether to repeat or not so maybe it won't go into the body if you have zero elements in your array um, and that can affect so the, the whether you execute the body of the loop or not affects the code that that uh, is executed afterwards. Um, so I, I usually add two tests in my loop uh, in every loop uh, function. So I execute zero times and I execute multiple times. Uh, I execute zero times because let's look at this function. You loop and then you set the total and then you check the total. But the thing is. If we don't go inside this function because we have no products, the total is not defined. You will get an, an error because the total is not there. So you cannot compare it to zero. Uh, so say you, um, so yeah, you, you need to test with no products so that you can catch this bug. Uh, another example, very similar. So let's say we fix that bug and then you add total equals zero. So now if it, if it executes without a single product, then it will still work. Uh, but the thing is, you see, I intentionally added a bug in there. It's supposed to be total plus equal to, not total equal, uh, plus equal, sorry, the price and quantity, not equal. When you say equal, what happens is that um, if you repeat only once, the total will contain the correct number. But if you repeat multiple times, you won't have the right total at the end of the loop because you keep overriding the, the total. This is why you should also write a test to for multiple products, not just once. So try it for for uh, no products and try it for multiple products so this is this is the way that you uh, make your test uh, bulletproof yeah and uh, thank you happy testing Oh, okay. Oh, it's too short time. Uh, this is the right testing. Uh, my name is Kenichi Okishida. Uh, I, I use six times KFS. Uh, this teacher is the uh, first time KFS for me in Chicago. And uh, this talk uh, data generator for testing te testing results. How many test data? Uh, check PHP supports a uh, fixture. Fixture is a good. Uh, good feature and bad feature in this list. Uh, fixture uh, programs has uh, easy breakables. This data is a fake data generator. Uh, whole PHP uh, fake, fake data generator measure is a faker. But a faker is a forecast uh, fake data value, not not forecast uh, fake entity. 
So I created Fabricate. Fabricate is an inspired uh, factory girl or uh, fabricate for movie walls. But the uh, first version is uh, focused only cake PHP. But uh, I updated version 2. Version 2 is a PHP library or supported uh, any, any frameworks. So at uh, CakePHP 3, uh, I created adapter for Fabricate V2. Uh, first version is a Fabricate uh, call to direct CakePHP 2. But at, uh, version 2 is a Fabricate any, uh, can use any frameworks. Uh, uh, Ray has layer adapter layers. Adapter layer called to uh, some frameworks, but uh, now only only has a whole cake PHP three adapter, but uh, no, no, not have uh, any frameworks or Laravel Symfony. It's uh, please contribute uh, any other frameworks you want to use. But uh, fabricate some uh, some APIs and some helpers and. Uh, so, if you uh, many 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 generate test data, uh, fixtures. If you use fixtures, uh, if you want to uh, send record one thousand uh, uh, test data records, uh, send one you 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 should write. But uh, you if you use fabricate a uh, one liner, fabricate create post. What's a very very easy examples? What one day things visit my GitHub. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I can't get this HDMI to work, so I'm going to wing it. This is actually my first talk, so it's uh, very uncomfortable, but I will try to make the best of it by just using my voice to make you imagine my vision, basically. And my vision is Cake.js, and it's basically just a Node.js application since you have we have had talks about uh, Node.js before and Socket.io so that makes it just much more simpler for me to explain this to you um, yeah yeah uh, I built a, uh, a project in Node.js which I call Cake.js and it's a, basically just a framework which uh, imitates Cake PHP in the structure of how it's designed uh, the code structure and project files and also how you use it. So my point is that I'm trying to make it simple for Cake PHP users and developers to actually just adapt to Cake.js and use that for, 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 for an example for real-time uh, communication through WebSockets. So uh, in those examples that has been there before, uh, we they used emit to transfer um, between client side and uh, server side, and uh, yeah, we, I have added a little more deeper um, and deeper layer for that. So I'm routing this to actually controllers and actions on JS uh, on the JS part, and then what I'm working on is basically just get that proxied into the cake PHP application also. So when it's done, it's going to be like real-time awesome layer. 
And um, yeah, and if you have any like questions or you're more interested in the project, there is, I have a GitHub page, uh, which basically looks exactly the same as KHPHP. So it's very easy for you if you have uh, gone through the KHPHP code because I'm trying to keep the structure basically the same. So the users that are going to use KJS is basically just have to read up on the tutorials for KHPHP and should be all done. So yeah. Um, yeah, I take questions uh, afterwards, not uh, during the microphone because I'm uncomfortable. But thank you very much. There's no HDMI connector? No, wait. There's no HDMI connector here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you shouldn't have assumed everyone owns a Mac. Yeah. Some people use Linux, right? Okay, so I'm going to do it without the slides then. Um, I was going to talk about disk. Uh, this is a job queue. Who who here uses any kind of job queue at, at their regular work? And what are the rest of you doing? Because you're supposed to be using this. Because if you build web apps and you're not using a job queue, you are doing it wrong, seriously. Like, what do you do when you send an email? Do you do it on the request? Oh, man, OK. First, find out what a job queue is. And then, OK, so what job queue are you using? Who was the one that raised their hands? Yeah, what kind of? What, what right is? My sequel, oh my god. Okay, so those who um, Mark use a Redis, most people use Redis as a job queue. And that's why like probably a month ago, uh, Salvatore San Filippo, who is he's the creator actually of Redis, decided to tackle this problem and say, Okay, I'm gonna build a job queue with the same technology behind uh, Redis, but particularly for job queues. So Redis um, disk is a distributed in-memory job queue. It's very really different in the sense how it's built uh, from RapidMQ or from Gearman or, or other ZeroMQ or other job queues in the sense that it's very distributed. It's very easy for you to launch new nodes, add them to a job queue, and it's very fault tolerant in the sense that it's prepared for more than one node to actually crash down during the process. So when you when you add a new uh, job to a, to a job queue, it doesn't assume that the node is gonna be working. So it's gonna replicate the job, uh, the job amongst all the nodes available, and it's gonna only then tell you, okay, I'm fine, I receive your job. There's also very, uh, a very unique way of handling with job fails. Those who work with job queues, job failing is actually a very pain in the ass process that you have to deal with, in the sense that when I'm writing a job, uh, job I'm processing a job, and something goes wrong, then I don't know what to do. Because most, most of the job queues don't know what to do either, so it's all fact. The email didn't go through, we didn't make the sale. So fortunately, this handles this very elegantly, uh, allowing us to say, OK, how many retries we need for a job if it fails? Uh, how much time uh, am I assuming that it would be OK for it, for it to be unprocessed? And after that time, we queue the job if, if it didn't uh, if it wasn't marked as process or, or anything else. Um, well, OK, time is running fly. Um, so I created a PHP client. Uh, well, I, um, the first thing that I have to clarify is that disk, since it was built literally less than a month ago, is not production ready. So <laughs> so this is all futile. No, uh, so you should really check into it. So I built a PHP connector for it um, that actually handles the the, the, the Protocol connection to disk uh, to disk, and it provides a wrapper on top of the very basic technology for job adding and job uh, queuing. Uh, so you can try it out. Uh, if I had a monitor, I would have been able to give you the rest. But otherwise, it's GitHub.com/Mariano/disk. How do you call the? Yeah, no, no, the dash dash PHP. Um, so. It's completely um, 
you can install it through Composer. It doesn't require any other dependencies. I, I actually favor projects that don't require any other dependencies and are very slim as well. So, um, so yeah, check it out. Go to the website. Check out what uh, Salvatore is doing because actually a lot of people are jumping on, on top of this. It's, it's an amazing uh, improvement to job queues. So we have like 10 seconds for questions. <laughs> what? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, you can do delayed, jo uh, delayed uh, jobs as well. You can say, okay, this job shouldn't be queued until like next Monday or whatever. That's also another improvement towards our job queues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, actually, that's on client, uh, it's on the client side. You have to implement that using different queues. So there's no concept of priority. You would do it yourself by just creating another queue. Uh, no, it's in memory, it has the option to store on disk, but it, uh, it's by default disabled, but you can do it, yeah. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I don't have any more time. <laughs> All right, my name is Chris Hickingbottom. Um, I'm actually the CTO of the uh, company that we uh, brought here. Uh, my development team, uh, two of the guys have already spoken. Uh, today I'm actually going to talk about uh, Airbrake and the plugin that uh, I uh, extended off from one of uh, uh, from the two version. And uh, how many of y'all actually uh, ever heard of Airbrake IO? Um, how many of y'all actually, if you haven't heard of it, or how are you logging your errors on a live on your live application? I mean, a lot of people don't realize the uh, you know during a live application errors you're not you're seeing those as they come up or you know a user gets it you're getting that report or something like that. That's not the ideal situation you want to be in in a production environment. Um, you actually want to be seeing those errors as they. As, as they go into the back end, your user has no idea that they're happening. You know, just going back there and you're getting a notification, you've got a panel you can go to and you can see those exceptions, those missing pages, uh, things like that, that you can be like, okay, hey, we got to figure out why this threw an error. And what it does, Airbrake provides that solution. They actually have um, a lot of different languages you can do it in. So you can do it in your JavaScript on the front end, so you can be sitting there logging any errors at your JavaScript and your code, all that stuff like that, you, as well as PHP and a multitude of other languages there. You got Node.js, Ruby, Java, .NET, and, it allows, and it, once you log in, it gives you a whole panel of just how many times an error has occurred throughout your application and you know other additional information, the route, the URL, the whole good bit. Um, my uh, thing actually uh, plug in, you can actually access it. If you go to the uh, awesome cake PHP uh, uh, GitHub right here, it is actually listed as the um, in right there under debugging. It's airbrake. Right there, it's pretty simple to set up. Once you get it on, you can install it with a composer and get it down there. Uh, the only thing you really have to do is replace in your uh, app config bootstrap file replace your error handler with the error handler I've written in there. And then from there, all you, you go to your app.php and you set you set your airbrake cake config. Um, you're gonna get it once you sign up for airbrake, you're gonna get an API key. You just put that in there. You have your options, which your options is what uh, the options in airbrake API where you can supply additional information, what you want to log, all that stuff like that. Um, it's fully functional to take all those options in. I also added the debug option, but that, a lot of the times a production site, or you you generally have debug turned off. But a lot, of, you know, when you're in your uh, debug environment, your uh, is your development environment debug is actually on. And a lot of the times you don't want those errors that your developers are sub and don't straight up to the airbrake because it will. 
Because uh, as they're developing and, you know, they're breaking stuff and creating new features, you're seeing that stuff go straight up the air brake. And that's the last thing you want to see. Really, you want to use air brake to tie in and have your own just on production server errors. And uh, you can actually turn it, once you set it to false, which is the right there, it will actually, and I have it defaulted to false anyway, um, it won't log any kind of debug when debug is on. And all, so when you push up to your live production server, you're only getting those air uh, errors on your air brake console and that's pretty much it right there All right, uh, so quickly, this is more of a design type oh, design type talk, um, uh, more related to your uh, web applications. I'm Manuel, I'm a product designer, I'm also a web and mobile consultant, I'm based in Montreal, and I am a salsa dancer. I've done that for about 10 years or so. So if you guys want to learn, uh, definitely come out with me tonight. I do that in New York every once in a while too. Uh, so moving on. Moving on. <laughs> uh, so it's five... Uh, Five design tips for your web or mobile product. Okay, so I'll run through this really quickly. Um, first is spacing. Things that I see all the time uh, when it comes to design is that you have a, a ton of different graphics or text that are all crowded together, um, and this is really not visually pleasing. The reason why you want to get away from this, not just from the aesthetic point of view, is also the fact that um, if you see a part of my French, a shitload of text together. Um, Typically, a user will not just skip over it and not actually read it. So you really want to give as much spacing as you can when it comes to different objects within your, your web application when it comes to the front end. Uh, next, uh, typography. Simple. These are very simple base concepts to stick with. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, you can go with a serif font with a sans serif font. That's a good, that's a good thing. Uh, you can go with sans serif with sans serif in terms of fonts. If you go with a serif and a serif font, um, that's a that's probably a big no-no, and it looks very very ugly. Typically, uh, a serif font is going to be mostly like your highlighted font or that font that's that's really adding character to it. So you try to, on a typical basis, if you're trying to build a decent uh, web app or user interface for that matter, try to avoid that third option. Uh, also, there's a lot of fonts out there apart from Arial and Helvetica. Um, if you want to add character to your app and give it a personality for that matter, there's a lot of fonts out there. Google Fonts, Adobe Typekit, and my fonts as well to be able to go and purchase other web fonts. I really strongly recommend that because nowadays what I'm seeing is that there's another Bootstrap app, Bootstrap, 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 and it's the same font over and over again. And there's very, there's very much lack of character when it comes to your application. So the thing that makes somebody remember your app the most is the personality and the character that's associated to it. Uh, images. You want to get away from the lady who is uh, high on cocaine on the left. Uh, so uh, I saw it has, uh, has this uh, really bad uh, stigma associated to it. Uh, I personally love more uh, realistic in uh, um, images that were kind of like down to earth, people actually working like Stocksy, which is great. Another one is uh, Unsplash, which is like free stock images as well. Really great photography that you can use uh, uh, for any one of your applications when it comes to uh, marketing material. Um, Colors. Uh, what you want to do is typically stick to minimal amount of colors and have one accent color. So you see three different uh, three different websites. Accent color on the bottom left is red. Accent color on the top is green, and the accent color on the bottom right is. Okay, it's green. Come on, guys. Okay, so it's green. Uh, so the idea behind it is you really want to try to factor that in and, and make sure that there's you're not using too much of one color um, that's just overpowering everything else. And you want to try to stick to that color that's very different and highlights things. Um, uh, logos. 
uh, take PHP really bad. You guys don't have SVG, SVG files on your website. You should totally have SVG files. They're awesome. They're compressed images. They're mobile friendly. This is just really, really awesome when it comes to it. And you guys should just start using more and more of them. Lastly, uh, you should consider internationalism. Uh, this is one thing that I see a lot of that actually people don't don't con consider. Uh, I'm from Montreal and not so gâteau means uh, obviously cake. So just factor there because in French there's about 30 to 30 to 40 percent more characters. In German there's like 50 to 70 percent more characters. So you always want to factor that in when it comes to your design and when it comes to your user interface because doing it in English. Uh, in Montreal, we're kind of uh, we have the benefit with the how we're mandated by the government to be able to do it in both languages. You should, guys should factor that in every time you do it, including the Cake PHP website. And uh, so I'm uh, Manuel, and if you have questions for me, uh, definitely come and talk to me. Yes. All right, so a lot of you use PHP every day. PHP has some fun, fun things in it, so we're going to go a very quick tour over what uh, the hell is going on with PHP. So list. Has anyone used list before? All right, what does this do? Mm, it doesn't make a list. So you're going to echo A. What are you going to get? You're going to get one. Oh, what? Not two. Less, list starts at the left side and works to the right. Just something to keep in mind. All right, in array. So you got this variable, you got an array with 7.1. You're like, I'm going to see if 7.10 is inside this list. And you're going to var dump that or do a Boolean check on it, and you're going to be like, what the fuck? Why did that happen? So the reason this happens is it coerces it to a float. Uh, 7.1 and 7.1.0, eh, good enough, um, it counts as in. If you put the third argument as true, it doesn't do the type coercion, always put the third argument as true, otherwise you'll get these fun uh, fun bugs. Um, yeah, so private, private properties and private functions. So you got this class, human, which uh, lets you define, get, the, get a name, but the name is a private variable, and you have a function called touch, and you're going to touch another human. Uh, so you're going to make two, two humans, Sally and Joe, and you're going to pass Joe into Sally. And Joe is, yeah. And then, and then Sally can just touch Joe. Um, even though the properties are private, methods and property scope in PHP are class level, not object level. So this is, this, you can abuse this to your, uh, for profit. If you get a class that is, you've inherited from, you can access all of its protected properties and all of its protected methods. It's fun stuff that you can do. It also works for statics, uh, traits that define pr private and pro uh, protected, you can access those as well. All right, everyone's favorite, equals, equals, equals. How does equals work? All right, so A is zero, X, B is X. And then we're gonna say false is equal to A, so that's false is equal to zero, right? So what, what do we think what's gonna happen? True, all right. And then we got a space, and then we've got A is equal to B, so X is equal to zero. Also true. So, this means that B is also equal to true. True. Therefore, false is equal to true in PHP. <laughs> if you do some algebra on that, you get false is equal to true. Come on, PHP. Come on. <laughs> Please stop. Okay, post increment. You got A is number four. What the fuck does this do? <laughs> I actually don't know. I had to look this one up. Turns out it's nine. Nine. So, because the plus plus on the, the, the left side of the A happens before the pluses on the right side. So you get five. So the inner A with the two pluses resolves first, and then the outer eight pluses add up. So you get five, and then A is four, and then you get nine. Just, 
Yeah. Just, just don't do this. There's a really easy way to fix this. Just don't do this. If you see someone in a code review putting pluses on the other side of the variable, just tell them to stop, put that down, step away from the keyboard. You don't get to type today. All right. This is one of my favorites, floats. I forgot the transition on this, so it's not going to work. Uh, so you got 0 0.1 times 0 0.1. You're like, you'll dump that. You're like, oh, it's double 0 0.1. That's good. And I'll just compare that to in 0 0.1 that I typed. PHP like, no, that's not. They're not the same. <laughs> Those are definitely not the same. The reason for this is that PHP uses uh, double precision floats, um, and there's a, a way off in the right, far off the, the land that you cannot see. There's a one. Um, <laughs> So always round before you compare floats, because they're often not the same. Um, if you're doing any money or math, you will lose money. Um, pennies, but you know Superman 3 has proven that this will all add up. All right, next up, ternaries. So you've got this ternary. You're like, oh, I'm going to nest some ternaries. Just don't do that, ever. They never work. Every time you see someone nesting a ternary, tell them to stop, put the keyboard down, figure out a different way. And that's all I got. Um, This one. My name's Justin Yost. I'm going to talk about uh, projects are better when they're maintained. Imagine that. Uh, projects that are unmaintained, they're not very useful. Projects that look unmaintained wind up not being projects that I want to use. If your project looks like it doesn't have stuff going on in it, I don't want to use it. And probably none of any other developers in here want to use it. Uh, so this is a project. It's a plugin that I had. I don't know, I released it a long time ago, probably, when is that? That's about a year-ish plus go. Um, it did some stuff, doesn't really matter what it did, right? But it looks kind of like it's doing things, and it's doing stuff in the right way. It's got a readme, it's on GitHub, it's open source, right? Except there's nothing that really tells me what the heck it is and what the heck it's doing, and whether it's maintained or not. Uh, here's what I did to make it look a little bit better, and now it looks like it's maintained. <laughs> even though really it's not actively developed, right? But it's got a release number on it. It's got um, a license on it. It's got, whether it's got build, it's got the composer stuff, it's got the number of downloads, which you can see no one uses it because you probably shouldn't use it. Um, you can see the actual requirements, right? I can actually look at this as a developer and say, okay, can I use this project? Can I not use it? When was the last version released? Does it have builds? Do the builds actually pass the last time that they were run? Uh, are other people using this project in some amount of numbers, right? If more people are using the project, it's probably better. Uh, what's the coverage on it? It's got the coverage on there as well. Those are all good things. Uh, yeah, what makes this look maintained? Uh, these are these things called the GitHub Shields, typically what they get tossed around as, and they're a neat little way for you to see all these different things. There's a ton of other ones as well. And you can even create custom ones. Uh, what does it, what does it provide, and what doesn't it provide? It doesn't actually say whether the project is regularly updated. Uh, that plugin in particular is not regularly updated because I just don't need to do anything with it. It doesn't say if the unit tests are any good, right? You actually have to look at your unit tests and see if they're actually any good. Uh, it doesn't say if it actually solves your problem. Maybe this doesn't. Maybe it will. Um, it doesn't say if the team behind it will actually respond to issues. Maybe they just close every single issue because they don't care about your issues and they only care about their issues. That's fine. Whatever. Um, what are the different ways that we can actually solve this for some Cake PHP 2.0 plugins? Uh, Friends of Cake has a Travis project. I can't see my mouse. Oops. Friends of Cake has, yeah, Friends of Cake has a Travis plugin that makes it really easy to set up Travis for 2.0 plugins. Uh, for Travis for 2.0 plugins, it was kind of a little bit of work. 
Friends of Cake made it easier. Uh, Loadsys also released a plugin skeleton that does kind of the stuff that I did for a bunch of Loadsys's plugins to make them all meet this standard and make them all look like they actually are maintained because we actually try to maintain them and we want to be good members of the community. Uh, for 3.0, Friends of Cake also has a 3.0 version of the Travis project. You should use this stuff. You should use Travis or some other CI. You should have unit tests. You should be doing all these sorts of things. Uh, some hard and fast rules. Make it easy as possible for developers to get information they need to make these decisions, right? The shields make it easy for me to make decisions for like whether the license is one that I can actually use in my project. Provide information that gives developers a stronger sense that the project will actually do what it says it will do. Unit tests, automated builds, documentation, etc. cetera. Uh, try to respond to issues. At the very least, triage them. Say whether or not you think it's a real issue or whether or not like the person is just making something up. Um, if your team has open source plugins, try to use the stuff that I pointed to to do this sort of stuff. And let's be good community members and actually release stuff and actually maintain the stuff that we release, please. Because I'm tired of going to repos that have nothing, no documentation, no Travis build, no nothing. I'm just, I'm tired of it. And Lotus is trying to do our part to make it better. So please, make it better. <laughs> Hi, my name is Curtis Gibby, and I'm um, going to talk a little bit about PHP Code Sniffer. Um, can I show, see a show of hands? Anybody who's used PHP Code Sniffer or is familiar with it? Some about half, maybe. Okay, so Code Sniffer. Um, we're going to go over quickly. What is it? How do I get it? And how do I use it? First of all, what is PHP CS? Uh, it's kind of like unit tests for your code style. Um, it, it parses your code to ensure that your code conforms to a specific standard. So it lets you know uh, things that smell in your code, certain sniffs, tabs versus spaces, or snake case variables, or whatever. Um, Cake, Cake PHP used to have their own uh, code sniffer standard, and recently they went to the PSR2 standard, um, which is a great thing. Um, I personally liked the, the old version better, but um, you know, PSR2 is a community standard, uh, so let's follow it. So how do I get it? Um, Squiz Labs has their PHP Code Sniffer um, plugin, um, and you can, you can get it with apt-get, you can get it with composer, you can get it with pair. Um, how do I use it? You can go on the command line. Uh, I'll, I'll go through that a little bit. You, you can use it in your IDE itself. And I only, I only use Sublime Text, so that's the only examples that I have, but there's also plugins for NetBeans, PHP Storm, and if you really want to hack around, I, I found out there is a, a Vim plugin. Uh, you can also use it as a pre-commit hook in Git. You can say, if it doesn't hit our, our standards, it doesn't get into our repo. And then you can also plug it into your CI. So on the command line, you could run a command against a specific file, phpcs, user controller, and I'm going to mark my standard as PSR2, and it spits out a bunch of errors. On line 19, I have a, an error, opening brace should be on a new line, 32, 34, you know, there's nine errors on these lines. Um, and I can now go back into my file and uh, find line 19, go fix that error. Of course, it's much easier in your um, IDE. You can set up in, in Sublime, uh, package install phpcs, you plonk in your um, your JSON for your settings, and then it'll in your IDE it, it'll t highlight the line. Oh, line 32 needs a space between the if and the uh, open parentheses. Line 34, same thing. Um, it, we also if it, if we're looking at PSR, we need to put the uh, the opening braces down one line. Down at the bottom, you can see. The, the error message, expected if, space, open parentheses, found if, open parentheses. So it tells us what problems we're having and how to fix them. Um, again, in your PHP CI, uh, you can set up to throw in your YAML. Uh, I, want to, I want to test PHP code sniffer. I want to test it against this path. I want to ignore these specific uh, paths, and I want to use this standard. 
And when your CI runs, it'll throw out all the errors, including PHP CI, uh, including code sniffer. So let, guys, let's keep it clean. I don't claim to be an expert on this. Uh, just, if anybody has any questions, uh, I've got a minute left. And maybe I can answer it. Maybe the community can answer it. Yes. Absolutely. There are tools that ostensibly, theoretically, can, can fix um, code problems. Uh, they, they work great a lot of times. A lot of times you might get uh, some, some stuff messed up. But that, that is a big helpful. Uh, helpful thing. Any other questions or comments? Okay. While I'm up here on my soapbox, I have another website called uh, badapostrophes.com. <laughs> I take pictures of people using apostrophes where they don't belong and put them up on the, on the web and, and publicly shame them. <laughs> if, you, if you see one, you can take a picture of it. Submit at badapostrophes.com and I will give you a thanks, give you a shout out when I post it. So thank you. How about now? There we go. All right, so basically what I want to show you is something that is very similar to Vagrant, um, but it's going to get your code up and running in the cloud as quickly as it possibly can. So this is a uh, open source project sitting on GitHub, which uses PHP and Redis. It was how they tested the initial data structures within the P in the uh, P Redis client library. I've taken a fork of this. How exciting. Um, but you can see here, the only thing I really modified, well, I'm saying that. Look at the repo. I changed a couple things. But what I did is I added this button to the readme file. It says deploy to Azure. What's behind this is you'll see one of those files that I changed is Azure deploy.json. What is that, you say? Well, it's a really awesome JSON file that basically describes the environment that you need um, in a particular way. And how can you get the information around that? Uh, well, there's this really awesome command line interface. Um, if you install it with Node, which is Azure, and uh, you can go in here and say, OK, I want to look at the groups. And if I look at the Azure group template list, I can find something that's going to match pretty close to the architecture that I have, MySQL, whatever. Uh, and it will allow you to like, look at the file, and you can describe your environment. My environment has two things. I need a place to run some PHP code, and I need a Redis server to store some stuff. So what I've done is I've described the environment with some parameters. These are things that. Uh, users are going to go and input. So I have site name, hosting plan name, uh, which describes like how many site or what sites go where. Um, the location, so what server around the world do I want to put this in? Um, the SKU for the actual site itself frees the default. Awesome for open source projects. Um, worker size going to be defaulted to zero because you don't want to make it too big. The repo URL. Um, branch, and then a little bit of information about the Redis cache cluster that I have. I go and I describe these resources. So first thing up, I'm going to uh, talk about setting up my Redis uh, server. I'm going to use the site name variable to make my Redis server and my website have the exact same information. Uh, and I set that up. Uh, then I create a hosting plan, which is a, a space to put sites into. Then I create my site. And uh, the site has a couple of different resources that I put in here. So I create a site, put it into the location that I've asked for. Um, 
And then in here, I have app settings, which are exposed as environment variables, so I can pass in uh, the information that comes from my Redis cluster. So I need um, the server host name, and because it needs a secure connection, I have a key in here as well. So those get passed in, and then I go and set up my source control. Now, this is an advanced scenario, because I actually need both a website and a Redis server. But what you could do is you could actually go in and with just the uh, readme file, if you have no external code whatsoever, you can add this one line here, which is uh, deploy to Azure, Azure deploy.net, deploy button, and then pass the deployment, and it will actually just push your website straight out there. So once you do that, you get a screen like this. Let me click the actual button, because this is the one that's been deploying for about 10 minutes. Um, it takes a little bit of time to spin up the Redis cluster. But you get an environment basically looks like this. The first thing you do is you set up so it's reading that JSON file. It describes the environment that you have. Uh, you'll have the ability to modify that. There we go. So one of the things I would have had to do is actually sign into my Azure account. Then I can select the uh, subscription I have, provide a name for the site name, the resource group, select a location like the West US or East US, and then hit Next. which for whatever reason is uh, <coughs> file a bug. All right, that will go to preview. It will show you exactly what's going on. And then eventually, you'll have it spun up uh, in the cloud. And unfortunately, I started to mine a little too late.